Good evening. Thanks for joining me. I'm Melissa Ridgen. We are here with this APTN special to put con first contact in focus. Before I introduce you to my guests, who you will cannot wait to meet, I'm sure, let's just take a look at what this series has been about. Partying and flop houses. They just always get money and, and handouts. How are they the worst off when they're given so much? We are being made to pay for something that we didn't do. Where's my money going? They don't paint their houses, they don't uh, fix windows. Welfare's not a career. They're angry at white people. I mean, they want you to feel sorry for them. Get off your ass if you're unhappy and go do something about it. Feels like it's just a lost cause at this point. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to my community so that you can see with your own eyes, experience with your own bodies, and feel with your own hearts what this community is really about. This could be not so bad, it could be good, or it could be like, holy, what did I just sign up for? I have not been to a reservation ever. We are going to stick out like school dogs. This is our way of life and just try and maintain it the best we can. If I was to stay at one of those homes, I would find a place to go and take a shower first thing in the morning. Welcome to Winnipeg's North Bat. It is very scary. For one, I'm the minority here. We're really looking at the long-term effects of the genocide. There's lots of things that happen in the world. We've got to look ahead. I'm just having a very hard time understanding. That's not an excuse. You're a prime example of society. This what this day to be over with. This is camping for them. For me, it's like hell on earth. We're not going anywhere. We've always been here. But how can we reconcile? How can we stand together? Thanks for coming to my community. I, I had no idea. It really puts a, a dark stain on the Canada that I thought I knew. I came here with ignorant views, and you know what? I was wrong. I've never felt so foreign in my own country. Just having you here is a good thing. A lot of our stories are similar. You know, I don't say one mile of my shoes, I don't understand. And we'll get there. I'm going to say one heart at a time. So you can see why this has, was hugely anticipated and a first of its kind in Canada. I'm now here with the six participants of this show who I'm going to introduce you to right now. We have uh, Ross, we have Dawn, we have Dallas, we have Ashley, we have Avonlea, and we have Jamie Sue with us. Thank you guys. Um, real, and truly, thank you, because after what you've seen of the show and what we've all seen of the show, it's pretty brave to be up here to be grilled and be accountable for what some of the things are that has, have been said on here. So I do thank you very much. Okay, my first question uh, is for each of you, and we'll just work our way down the row. What made you want to be part of the show? I have a sense of adventure. So I, you know, once I kind of got an idea of what was going <coughs> on with the show, I thought it was, uh, you know, something that I'd be interested in. And I've, you know, I've traveled a lot around the world, and, you know, I, when I heard it might be going up to the northern part of Canada, somewhere I would never get a chance to go. I thought it was a great opportunity. Huh. What about you, John? Um, well, pretty much the same thing. Uh, I've, as you seeing the show, you know that I'm a bit opinionated. Um, <laughs> a little bit. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to get some education and just see what, uh, what's really out there. So you were looking for education? Yes. You went into this looking. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm going to remember that when I come yeah. back and ask you questions. <laughs> okay. Dallas. Yes. What made you want to do this? Uh, for the adventure, the experience. I'm young. I'm single. I can kind of get up and go whenever I please. I have that, uh, you know, availability. Um, and I was very, like, I was uneducated about the matter. You know, I feel like we should always be wanting to learn and grow. There's always room for improvement. Uh, and I'm so happy that I did this experience. So what did you, what did you think, I mean, uh, what were you told this show was going to be about? I'm sure it was a pretty small scope. Yeah, it was very vague. It was yeah. very vague. And we didn't really learn that it was going to be focused on um, Indigenous to the later part of, you know, the casting or whatever. But um, I, was still, I was still intrigued 
I was still, uh, you know, very, uh, very enthusiastic about it because, you know, I come from the East Coast of Canada. Um, mm -hmm. People my age, you know, the, we don't really see a whole lot of Indigenous people in our high schools, in our, you know, you know, in our community centers, things like that. So for me, it was kind of like, I don't know a whole lot, but I'm still willing to go out there and put myself out there. Um, you know, obviously watching through the trailer, there's some biased views mm -hmm. that I've had. But, you know, as you watch the documentary, you'll learn to see that, you know, some people's minds change. And, mm -hmm. you know, the whole experience, I met so many beautiful people and watching that trailer right there. I kind of had the chills seeing so many, like, familiar faces, yeah. you know. So, you know, it was a little scary. I'm not going to lie, you know. Well, well you yeah. know, scary. I just want you to know why you wanted to do it. Yeah, I'm yeah. Looking, We're looking at the perspectives here, yeah. and I'm going, well, why would you want to, uh, you're hearing these words come out of your mouth. Yeah. I'm looking going, why the hell do these people want to get on a bus and go and <laughs> yeah. hang out in indigenous communities? Yeah. It wasn't making sense, so I'm hoping that you guys can fill in these blanks for me. Ashley, what made you want to be a participant? Uh, for myself, I have always a sense of adventure. That's yeah. just who I am. I do ridiculous things that my parents shake their head at. Um, and also, I like to be vulnerable, so mm -hmm. I like to open myself up to learn, whereas a lot of people are afraid. Um, whereas for myself, I figured, why not open myself to learn a lot more? And again, like, we didn't really know what we were getting into until, mm -hmm. like, the last kind of part. And for me, it was, I was up for it, because truthfully, as you saw over the last couple of days or three days, I didn't know much about our Indigenous culture. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it was a fantastic opportunity to be vulnerable and be open. I like that. Yeah. Avili, why do you want to do it? You're busy at home with two kids. You can it's like, I've got time to take off. You just did it for the vacation. Uh -huh. You're like, I need 28 days away <laughs> from mom my <laughs> job. <laughs> Honestly, it was, uh, it was more than just getting away from the, the turmoil of having two small children. Right. I mean, they're both toddlers. It's a tough day to day and I'm at home constantly with them. So. It was a little bit, for me, a little bit selfish, for sure. But when you're in the early stages of motherhood, you don't get to do anything for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I got to take this experience. And when we learned what the content matter was in the last part of the casting, um, it turned into more for me. It turned into an educational thing that I wanted to learn more about our Canada so that I mm -hmm. could teach my kids, you know, because there's so much... There's so much stigma, there's so many t stereotypes, and I've got two small minds that I get to start from get-go to teach them properly, and that's what I wanted. I love that. Jamie Sue? Uh, adventure, and I really wanted to test myself to see if I could do it, how much I would open up, uh, mm. how much I would learn, and it was invaluable and literally changed my life, so I'm very grateful <coughs> for it. So at any point, I mean, given your perceptions uh, of indigenous people were you worried because you're asked these questions so you have to know that this this might be what we see on tv um before you agreed to do it before you signed on did you think like oh maybe people are going to think i'm a racist i'm a little i'd rather, rather keep my ignorance to myself or i'm an open book honestly um you know i feel like any questions that i've asked throughout the process or throughout the show that if i'm thinking it there's somebody at home that's thinking yeah. it you know, yeah. and, and like, I'm not, I'm not going to hold back any punches. Like if I, I want to make sure that if I am in the wrong, I want to ask the questions that somebody's going to make me right. And it's mm -hmm. going to be educational for not just me, maybe for the castmates, for the people and the viewers watching at home as well. Because there are so many stereotypes that we know about Aboriginals and Indigenous yeah. people. So, you know, I, I think that's the biggest misconception is that yeah. there's so many stereotypes and nobody's taking the time to go and learn Absolutely. and figure it out. Why do you have that stereotype? Do, right. Is it just it's passed on by your parents or what you read in the news? We know that so many things are generated just to get ratings. Yeah. This isn't. This Did is you know real. you had these stereo like were they stereotypes to you? Do you look and go, oh, I have all these stereotypes in my mind about Indigenous people? Or do you... Did you think that some of those things that we heard you say, I there was, on, they were fact-based? I think on some level, you do know that they're stereotypes because they're not good things to say about anybody. So when you say these negative things that, you know, generate this negative connotation to a specific mm -hmm. person, then how can you say after that that that's not a stereotype? Mm -hmm. We created it in our minds based on other things maybe it's based on a fact but that doesn't mean it applies to every single person mm -hmm. who is indigenous in this case yeah i think when it comes down to the, like the taxpayers money going to you know all these reserves and things like that i thought that was fact-based yeah. 
you know, I think that's different. You know, if you're going to say, like, every Indigenous person on the, you know, that are homeless on the streets, mm-hmm. you know, are drunks, well, then that's definitely, like, a non-factual one, right? That's definitely one thing about the tax money that I know a lot of people in my life also thought that. Like, I mm-hmm. did, and I flat out said it in my thing. And to learn that that's not the case, I was like, what? Yeah. So it made me want to dig a little bit deeper. And also, I can help educate these people that back home, like friends and family, like, hey, guys, like, this is not actually what's happening. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know. And, like, I was not taught this stuff in high school, which yeah. I think I know is being more taught more now. But, like, for me, there's a lot of things that were showed that I, I legitimately wasn't aware of. And I mean, I'm, I'm very happy for me, that living with my friends, were on, they lived on the reserve. I grew up with these kids. Mm-hmm. I didn't know. And I mean, I wasn't closed off to the fact. It's just something that wasn't talked about and isn't talked about still, and it mm-hmm. should be. It needs to be talked about the only so that everyone are, gets educated. The only things that are spoken about are the negatives. Exactly. And it's well, in I think the media. There's, there's uh, getting back to the funding and how much money is thrown at these First Nations communities. I mean, a lot of Canadians believe that. And it's true that there is tons of money that goes through the federal Indian Affairs mm-hmm. Ministry. But what I think a lot of people don't realize, and I want to know if you heard this on your, on your travels, that that money doesn't just go from, here's from Ottawa and, and is disseminated against or, or toward, towards all of these uh, communities, these hundreds of communities. It's, it's whittled away at long before it gets there. So if you have a dollar leaving uh, Indian Affairs, by the time it hits the ground in that community, it's probably going to avoid eight cents. So that's what they're living on. You've got lawyers, consultants, bureaucrats. It's, it goes, there's a, a bunch of places that that money gets shaken out of long mm-hmm. before it hits the community. Did you yeah. guys hear? We did learn things that. Like yes, that? we did learn that from some of the elders and chiefs uh, that, you know, the lawyers were a big one. They were a massive one. And, yeah. And it's, you know, you think, okay, it, when you put it in that aspect, we're a dollar. And then by the time it gets down to the very bottom, eight cents, well, it's not enough. You and know. that's what you're seeing when you're in these communities. Absolutely. I, and a lot of the, there was some shocking, well, shocking to Canadians, not shocking to Indigenous people who have, right. who have been it's, there. It seems but like it's, it's corrupt. It should it's like, not be that. Shouldn't you have way, more money? You know? should, shouldn't these places be nicer because of all the money you're getting? But well, it, it wasn't, it's not, sorry. It's not yeah. about just the money. People think it's just coming straight from our taxes. Yeah. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's coming from trust. It's coming from the treaty obligations. It's all these yeah. things that are leading up to that, that people are adamant that it's their taxpayer dollar it's not yeah and who told them it was yeah my next question is there anything after watching all of these episodes that has left you embarrassed no uh, not for me anyway you have no no embarrassing moments on there no i don't think so no my two guys on the end no no not embarrassed Uh, by anything i thought they were going to show some of the pictures when i had tears in my eyes and i didn't see that so that's good (laughs) interesting any of you guys embarrassed by anything that you saw uh, I think not. I've got one. Oh, one that I was like, ah. <laughs> there's some crazy were these things. Do like, tell, yeah. do tell. Like, okay, there was the one thing um, in there where they said Dallas and I and Don didn't want to get out of the van. At so the powwow. We, yeah, at the powwow, a lot more to that. I was not a chicken. <laughs> just throw that out there. No, I um, think, a lot more to that than yeah. just we don't want to get out of the van. No, yeah, we was, are going to talk a yeah. little bit more about that. Thank um, you. you guys. Anything that you look back at and went, oh, that was an embarrassing. Not I, I don't feel I don't feel embarrassed personally. I feel embarrassed that some of the views didn't change mm-hmm. as a whole. You know, we all went on the same journey, and it seemed like there were missed opportunities for people to have a different perspective, mm-hmm. and that's how I feel embarrassed as Canada as a whole that we act like this. Yeah, I I, I felt like I was a little embarrassed at points because. I was so uneducated at the beginning, you know. I was very uneducated. Mm-hmm. I didn't know, really know much about the race or the culture or the traditions. I was like, I was like, when I when I got in there, I was, I was a sponge because I was interested. Yeah. But when I hear, you know, when you when you first do my bios and things, I'm like, oh man. Well, you were pretty matter of fact. You weren't curious about. I wonder what it. I hear these things or I hear these things. Yeah. You were very like, this is what I think. And you what, were pretty matter of fact about your ignorance. Yeah, and you know what? And that's okay because a lot of the people that don't go out and experience this firsthand are going to be like that you know like like i said when i went through high school and i went through you know middle school there was no books about residential schools it's a shame that at 26 years old i had to come to do this documentary to learn about residential schools where it's one of the most cruel things that ever happened in canadian history 
Are you, know, you disgusted that you had to that you weren't taught this in school? Well, it, 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 it feels like the school and the kind of the government just kind of under the rug, right? It's kind of like they want to get it. They don't want to put it out there. It's I a feel dark like. stain, like um, Jamie Sue said. It is very dark stain on Canada. And yeah. I don't know if that's why they don't teach it, but they should. And I can tell you they are now. I have a yes. young son, and this is part of the curriculum now. So there is some hope for the next generation. But mm -hmm. for all well, of us, this wasn't in. We that. weren't learning about any of this. Anyways, we're going to need to take a quick break. When we come back, I've got a bunch of clips that we're going to discuss with the participants from First Contact. So stay with us. <laughs> I'm joined with the six participants from First Contact. Uh, we're going to talk, we, just before the break, we were talking about residential schools. And throughout the series, we heard a lot about residential schools. Uh, Ashley, you said you've never even heard of residential schools before. Yeah, never. Never. Until this trip. Pretty well, much. two of us here have, and we're going to go to clips. We were trying to help them. That was what we were trying to indoctrinate them into our society. You know, if we had done nothing, it probably wouldn't have been any different. You know, if I heard that all these kids that were in residential schools were taken, you know, kicking and, and screaming out of their homes and their parents were kind of pushed aside to do that, that's bad. That's really bad. And I agree that it's bad. In the meantime, I'm still skeptical. Well then, <laughs> and in uh, episode one, Ross, you also had said that you believe or feel like people have exaggerated yeah, abuse at residential schools. You guys met a lot of people in this journey. Do you still feel uh, that this was exaggerated? How well, do you feel about residential schools? And uh, the, the you know, I've heard, I've heard, history? you know, on this show, we kind of got a one-sided of, of it. You know, I, I know Native people who went to residential schools, mm -hmm. and some of them said it was, there was no issues. It was, you know, it was a, a fine time in their life. They, you know, had a roof over their head. How they many had, people? I, you know, I, well, my dad had my friends he worked up in up north with that I, be, you know, knew of who were of uh, native, and they, you know, the conversation went, and they. The two people you've heard from. Yeah, two people. I don't even know, probably okay. what I hear from here, four or five. So you know what I mean. You it, could, probably, if you did some research, you could probably find more than yeah, you could four probably, or five said, that yeah. had a bad time at residential. Yeah, school. I, I just said, but you know, we don't know what the percentages were. You know what I mean? Okay. Like I said, there's people nowadays. There's issues with other stuff. In the, in, within the churches, it still goes on, right? So, you know, I mean, I'm just saying that we, we kind of, in this show, kind of put the negative spin totally on it. We never had a positive spin on it at all. What about you? You well, After your journey catch, through this? Just catching on one of your comments that you made, that if you talk to a bunch more people, you hear a lot of bad stories. But if we talk to a lot of people, we might hear a lot of good stories, too. We talked to a few people. I've been uh, in this business a long time talking to residential school survivors, I, and I, I have that. come up with none. None? I understand that. but on None that are like, hey, this is the time of my life. Oh, no. No. You know, no. I found a lot of, of survivors who could, find, who, who could find things that they did that they enjoyed to get through the day, through the misery mm. of being in what effect is a, a concentration camp for indigenous kids. You could find, so there would be moments that they would cling to. to but get some kids through. went home every night. But Some these, kids, right? These, we went. Those are day schools. Those are I know. Different. So they, they were residential schools. They were. They went home every night. You might find s fewer people to complain at that. I will give you that. But okay. I'm not saying. I'm saying to you. I've been in this business for 20 years, and mm -hmm. I've not come across people who have anything positive to say, in okay. terms of the overall experience at residential schools. During during this journey, uh, we had an opportunity to talk to some ladies at hotel here in Winnipeg that were in town for a, uh, an award ceremony mm -hmm. um, that told us about their experience in residential school and uh, they were in town getting awards for their teaching in their community up north. Mm -hmm. um, the exact words she said was there were some problems but there was some good too. Okay. And these are indigenous women? These yeah. are indigenous yeah. women from the reserve in northern Manitoba. So do you think if you can find a couple comments to say that there was some good in residential schools, that that is good enough does that not, they existed? Are you excusing their existence? It does not the negative. It no. never would. Okay. But we keep hearing that there was absolutely no good that came from residential schools. I think those if ladies we're gonna have are just trying to, you know, move on. They're trying to not dwell on those That's negatives. Okay, but, and but instead of like telling you all about the bad, they're trying to say, you know what, I'm above this. I'm going to move on mm -hmm. and I'm going to make it a good thing. I, I won't deny that there was bad. Um, I asked one lady, I said, 
Tell me something about the uh, the beatings that took place in the residential Why did you put water yeah. clothes on the We had an argument. No, after We're going to have another one. Beatings, though, that, does but, that, that to me implies well, that you don't believe that they I'm, have. I want, I want to explain my comment. And okay. my comment simply is that beatings can be defined in different ways. I was beaten as a child. I was beaten in school. And the beatings I got in school were the same beatings that we had explained to us from some of the residents mm -hmm. or some of the people from the residential schools. We had a strap. We had a razor strap about that wide and about that long. Mm -hmm. We had teachers that had wooden paddles that used to make a big joke of getting you up in the front of the class and getting you to bend over in front of the class so they could whack your backside. Were your parents forced to put you in that school, though? Pardon me? Were your parents forced to put school you in that was. school, or were you taken? You, you are too young to know I'm that asking you. when we were kids, we had to go to school. We had to go to school, too. That's not, Did you get that's to go home to loving parents at the end of the day? I got to go home to a loving mother, yes. people had to yes. get permission to see their children at no. holidays. I, you're still talking about something. I'm talking about the difference between a physical, somebody punches you and beats you, mm -hmm. or someone gives you the strap, same as we got in all the rest of the schools. There's different degrees of beatings. I didn't Why does consider it matter? I, and none of those degrees are right. I <laughs> didn't. I didn't say they were right. Okay. I didn't say they were right Why for me. Why do we have to dis dissect each kind of beating? It's I'm beating. just saying that you have been sheltered. Okay, you've you've <laughs> spent your life being sheltered. Oh, Did who? you ever get the strap in school? Who's been sheltered? Let's let's this up right now. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to Avonlea. I don't care. Why do you want to single me out? Because, because I'm the you're only you're one, the only one that argued with out. me about it. So I'm the one, I'm the only person here who has that opinion of you. It doesn't matter what kind of beating it was. It was a beating nonetheless, I, I, and it affected the I entirety of their culture. I understand that. I, and I, we Do had that discussion. Do you still have a culture? Do you still speak English like you were taught at home? Well, I've always spelled. Can you I mean, still grow your hair however you want? I couldn't when I was a kid, but I can now because I'm my own boss now. Well, let's talk about these beatings in school, though. I mean, that's uh, the, the colonizers brought that. So the same beatings that you got, the kids at residential schools exactly. got. That's from colonization. And that's who, and who ran, the, and who ran the residential schools? There were religious groups. Okay? Mm -hmm. Who's raping choir boys? Religious groups. So you think so, the residential schools would have been better if it didn't have a church involved? If it was just the government taking control, maybe, stealing babies from their I don't know. parents? I can't answer that I think question. when the church is combined with the you government, it's never good. You can't answer that, though, yeah. because yeah, you good. met people who had first-hand experience. What about the guy in Muskrat Dam who said his brother was taken and put right onto a plane? Or the next year, yeah, he was put right onto a plane. After that, I didn't know that you had that conversation until I watched the show recently. Yeah. And after that, he continued through the entire journey to say, I'm still skeptical. I'm still not sure if that actually happened. Mm -hmm. You got first-hand conversation that it did happen. And you're still sitting here saying, right. Did he lie? Do you feel like you were lied to? That person lied to you about their experience? Uh, that conversation, I, I'm not going to say that. I thought that was a lie. That was a person talking about his personal experience. So you're still not convinced after you hear somebody's personal experience? That's again, we go back to that same argument. That's one person. Okay. What about Rick? What about Rick Lightning? Though. What about Rick Lightning? Story? Thousand kids went through residential school. Were 150,000 kids lassoed? There's a video uh, where they say the kid was lassoed and dragged. Mm -hmm. Okay. So of those kids, how many? What would make it? A, what's a figure that you're okay with? <laughs> exactly. There's no figure that I'm okay with. I'm not so saying that's good. So one would be too much for you. So uh, then you do have a problem with residential schools, and you I see have the damage a problem they've done with to the that digits. aspect of residential schools. Yes, and okay. I said that in the in the show. I don't feel like it's. But we're going to move on. How many, should, by show of hands, how many people here have read the Truth and Reconciliation Report and the 94 calls to action? Not all of it. Only a little bit of it. I've looked at it. I think we were shown some of it maybe by Rick. He did give us a treaty book. Or maybe it was with um, Louie, Chief Louie. I can't remember. I can't but remember. It's like information overload. Since yeah. the show, nobody's went, huh. I'm going to go and dig into that a little bit. I feel like I did do some research, but yeah. being a young mom and having two toddlers, yeah. you kind of... Your oh, day gets away from you. Reading is not something I used to practice. For me, it was like I went into the Indian Act a little bit because it's oh, interesting, brutal. Um, and then learning more about the treaties, which I had no clue about, which yeah. was shown. Um, so I, I have 
try to do a little bit of digging and also meet people in the community in, in Ottawa. And there's a whole Aboriginal, Indigenous community in Ottawa that I didn't know was there. Like, I didn't even know there was massive powwows that happened because mm -hmm. it's not advertised. And so I went and asked. And so what does assimilation mean to you? I mean, when you go and you dug into these sort of things, did assimilation, was that a word that meant anything to you guys before? Or, and and what, what does it mean to you now? What, what do you... I've heard it before, it. Yeah. Um, not in, not in de definite context. Like I never really knew what it meant, but now after being on this journey, you know that it means they took people and tried to make them be something they weren't, mm -hmm. and they forced it. It was a forced action, and that's what I feel assimilation means. It's a negative mm -hmm. to me. It's not. There's nothing that really can be positive of it when you're taking something away from someone. Yeah. That's how I feel about it. Okay, I want to go to another clip. Don has a shirt business. Let's take a look at that. Let's call it my unity shirt. <laughs> the, the letters mean assimilate or leave. Fit in or f*** off. <laughs> a native person, by definition, is a person who was born here, so I'm a native Canadian. So it upsets me when somebody says that they are, have better rights because this is their land. First of all, I'd like to comment that that shirt has nothing to do with an indigenous population. I've spent most of my life working with card-carrying indigenous people. I'm not a stranger to an indigenous people. The people that we met on this trip are the people that I've worked with. Okay, people so those who shirts... are out working, okay. paying taxes, doing everything that I do, and most of the ones I know have better homes than me bigger vehicles than me, more toys than I have, and happy lives. They're working people. So these, how many, tell me, are you still making these shirts? I, I this is a hobby. But Did those shirts, those shirts have a little bit more to do with our federal government than anything else, so. Well, the federal government has. I appreciate that, but it's nothing a, to do with indigenous over population. indigenous population here. Um, what do you, you know, you look at shirts like that, and you're saying that it had nothing to do with an indigenous population or indigenous right. people. But at the same time, you're saying you look at people who've got more than you, and they're not doing anything. Do you, you feel? Whoa, 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 whoa. And they're not doing anything. Well, you would. These said, are people that are working hard, making a good living, and and purchasing things on their own. Oh, sorry, I'm misunderstanding. Taxes. I'm misunderstanding. So no. that, what did that? What did they have to do with that shirt then? Because the indigenous have, people have, have nothing fitted, to do with that. I have, worked on a construction site with I'm missing the point, maybe. about 50% of the people that were there were indigenous, mm -hmm. and about 10% of them were, were uh, what's the term that they used for bringing in people from immigrants? Not immigrants. We're talking about temporary, temporary workers or whatever mm. from another country. Right. Nothing to do with the indigenous population of this country or Australia or whatever. And we were put through a... Uh, a training session, if you will, on how we had to treat them. Mm -hmm. My experience is they weren't put through that same training session to deal with us. And uh, along with the indigenous people that I worked with, we all had the same opinion of that particular group of people. Hmm. So that, that has nothing to do with the indigenous population. But so you the were filmed fit in, the fit in or f shirts, not for Indians. But that, you were filmed the, for the show. The content of that shirt that has shirt. to do with one specific group of people. And the indigenous people that I worked with had the same opinion as I did. Okay. Ross, do you mm -hmm. think that indigenous people, you've had this 28-day journey, you've had time to reflect. Do you think indigenous people should assimilate? Um, the way Canada's going now, uh, we're not, I guess, everybody's allowed to pick what they want to do and how they want to be. So I guess in uh, 2018 and in the future, as per uh, the way things are going, I would say probably not. Not to assimilate? Not to assimilate, no. Why? As I said, it seems like you can come over to this country from wherever you're from, and you can just do what you want. You we can... didn't come from anywhere. No, I, so... oh, I, oh, you know, I personally didn't, but my forefathers before me came from somewhere else, and they simulated. <coughs> and, but the, nowadays, it doesn't seem like it's, it, you, you, you do not have to. Okay. From uh. a, actually, from an anthropological standpoint, there is not one human being on North American continent that originated here. Are we going to start that? No. Are, we, are we really going to go into I want to know right that now? these, have these conversations, well, these say, for this for days. Days. I, wanna, oh, I would like to know about this conversation, about, please do, I want to know. 
Well, it's not from, if, you're, if you're into, okay, I'm not religious at all, but, but if you're, you're into creation. <laughs> no, I'm no, not an anthropologist. So from an anthropological point of view, The anthropologists here. say that all life started in Africa. So we're all descendants dinosaurs. from Africa. You said dinosaur isn't your thing. What does it have to dinosaurs do with this? Was, uh, what does that give the right to anyone to take people's kids and beat them in a school and make them assimilate? What, what does that have to do with the content? We're here to talk about something that's so important. You keep driving it somewhere else to steer people's ideas into something that's not about how wrong your opinions are. You keep trying to direct the conversation to something so we're not focused on what you are saying. But I, I want to know what the point of it is. Like, what do you hope to accomplish by saying nobody was, nobody was here? Well, then originally, no humans were here. It's to argue. Anything okay. to argue about anything. Let's, it's let's like having two separate fact. conversations. Yeah. Like, okay. mm. yeah that's this is a lot, a lot of, the of the time during our journey, we I'm would get into that. these mm -hmm. conversations and they would end up going nowhere. And it was very frustrating and I think that's why Don and I clash so much is because I can't stand it when we're wasting time on when there's something Selfish so things. important yeah. there's something so important here and we actually get a chance to discuss it and learn from it and we want to talk about dinosaurs <laughs> well that seems like a good point to take a break because we are not here to talk about dinosaurs we are going to need to take a quick break when we come back we've got more clips so stick around Hello and welcome back. I'm Melissa Ridgen and I'm here with the six participants from the hot docu-series First Contact. So Avonlea and Jamie Sue, I think people kind of thought, first impressions being what they are, it's like, oh, these kinds are kind of softies, right? Um, I have a clip from you, Avonlea, that I want to watch. I would definitely classify us in the middle class and my mom helps us out quite a bit with Having one income, we really have to work at it. We have a house, we're paying the mortgage off. When she compares her situation to that of an indigenous family's, Here, you help Rory. Come here. she feels put out. I'm not sure how it works on the reservations, but I think they're given a house. They didn't earn the dollar to pay for that house. Whereas in my house, I have to work hard for everything we have, and my husband works hard for the money. It, it's a nice idea to think that you just get some money from the government and don't have to worry about things. So you've seen the houses that Indigenous people are given. Do you still feel put out? Uh, you know what, I don't feel put out because I feel they did earn that dollar. Mm -hmm. Whether it was through the generational trauma, through their time in residential schools, everything that they get, they deserve. There's no one, I should rephrase that. I don't think that you should say to them that they don't deserve anything or that what they're getting isn't earned because mm -hmm. it's, it's apparent. They have to go through so many things. I was reading recently that here in Winnipeg they have um, the hydro and on some reserves they're going to lower the hydro. Well, that's because they're paying astronomical prices mm -hmm. when their houses aren't billed to code because mm -hmm. the heat is escaping and, and some people would argue that they shouldn't have to pay a lower a percentage of hydro. Well, yeah, they should, yeah. considering, you know, we've got to lift people up. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are. Why aren't we helping people? You see a homeless person on the street, you give them a sandwich. I don't look at the color of their skin. Mm. You can take two eggs, one's white, one's brown. You crack them open, they look the same. We're all the same inside. So why is yeah. everybody so focused on what is on the outside? I want to talk to you guys about, um, well, no, let's back up a little bit. I want to talk to you about this too, but while we're still on housing, you know, there is that conception that, oh, these, these indigenous people get all these free houses and free houses. You went and saw the free houses. And you made some, a comment, Avonlea, about the, you know, it's, it's not a free house. They went through a, a, a lot. They're, oh, they, they go through treaties and, uh, you know, cultural genocide. And, and you look and go, well, and this is what they're owed, I guess, is this house? Like, oh, it's not does enough. It, it's does never it, going to be enough because, and you know what, the way I say that, it's never enough. I don't feel like we can ever make up for it. That's how I feel. Not, it's never going to be enough because mm -hmm. they want it to be more. It's not that. It's not that they think they're owed so much. It's they deserve, you know, 
Yeah. They deserve something for what they went through, and I don't know how what to make that think? better. Let's be honest, that? though. When they get you know these houses, they're built brand new. The upkeep to them just isn't there. You know what I mean? So it's not like they're, oh, they're built they're, badly. They're, I did a whole investigative series on on reserve the quality housing. Quality is terrible. You it's know not. This. You're yeah. you're thinking, oh, if I got a new house, I'd take care of it. That it's not the same. Now you also have to factor in overcrowding. So you've got a substandardly built house with the the lowest of the low of materials. Yeah. Slapped together, and then you f throw in overcrowding. Yeah, we learned a lot I about mean, that. I mean, these houses are not well. built to last more than two or three years. So well, that's the uh, problem, though. That's the problem. Why why not invest in better quality homes? With the with the funding that you have, right? Why why are we buying the lowest grade? Because you the should turnover. be the Indian Affairs Minister, you know? and then huh. you could do that. Yeah, I don't know it. about that. One step at a time. <laughs> we went into a place, Ashley and I, when we were on our walkabout with the Bear Clan, and there was a house that we went into, and you know, everywhere along the walk, there's bags of beds, like they had bed bugs. Mm -hmm. It's something that they couldn't control, they couldn't condense, they couldn't get rid of it. But who's helping? Like who's there helping? Yeah. We're, the government's going to throw money at something stupid all the time yeah. so why can't people have a bed to sleep on and then there's six people in a one-bedroom place like it's yeah it is insane. Well, I mean overcrowding and poor housing is I mean you could do stories for I could anyways we're gonna move on to another clip I want to go to this clip this is from uh, the group's trip up north to Kimrit Ninevit Dallas Ross and Jamie Sue shop at the local store for dinner 11 bucks for a bottle of ketchup. Holy yeah. God. Wow. Somebody's making a killing somewhere. Full supply and demand at its finest right. right there. Supply After paying the bill, Ross is left with a serious case of sticker shock. Five bucks for this. Five bucks. Pretty disgusting, the prices these poor people are paying. So I want to hear from you guys, too. I mean, that was a, the northern leg of your trip was... I mean, breathtakingly Amazing. beautiful, awesome. yeah, but I want to know what what else uh, aside from sticker shock did you leave with from that community? Oh, floor. How they all work together, which is amazing, and they don't they don't have a lot. No, but it's like they make a lot with what they have, yeah. and in the communities, like you saw the clip, I was like, oh my god, with the meat. Um, I was in for, I didn't think you were gonna do it. I didn't oh, know I'm like, she's not going to do it. I feel like she um, was actually more into it than I was. <laughs> it was, it was interesting seeing how the, the Inuit all come together as a community. So when, say, they get a caribou, it's not just I'm keeping all of this caribou for just, like, my house. They give it to, like, the entire community. Yeah. I mean, that's with everything that they do. And it's funny because where I live, like, your house, I can literally spit on my neighbor's house. Yeah. Um, from my porch. So you, I look at my street no one talks to each other. You don't share your caribou. Definitely not. It's all mine. <laughs> but, like, no one talks to each other, but you go to this community and everyone is whole. Yeah. So that was, that was really nice to see. What did you take uh, from your I was going to say, one of the gentlemen we met with, I had a conversation with, and um, I asked him if he was proud to be Canadian, and he said he was. Then we went further south, and I asked the chief if he was proud to be Canadian. He says, I'm not Canadian. So, you know what I mean? What I found for those people, they were more happy to be part of the land and part of the country than what we met further south. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a tough existence up there. It's a tough yeah. life. And so did you ask why, or have you thought to yourself, why is it that uh, the people in the Canada's far north seem happier well, with this country than in other parts that you Maybe because they didn't have to assimilate as much. I feel like the, the colonizers aren't up there. They've right. been left to Stupid. themselves. That's it's why too cold. Happy. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, that's, I bet you that's what it is. Um, Dallas, you had a meltdown up there. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? What was wrong? There's just a lot to take in. Like, everything about none of it was completely out of my world. You know, the, the landscape, you know, it's like the place completely missed the industrial revolution you know like there's no there's no mcdonald's or tim hortons that you can just go pop into um we went we went seal hunting and caribou hunting for a long day and i'm talking a long day and um yeah i ended up getting into the water and i started getting really cold and i was hungry and there was a point and you know i was having this meltdown and there's a camera on me and they're like well how do you feel i was like how do i feel i was like i got puddles in my boots i'm shaking to the bones i was like i'm starving they're eating fish heads in there i was like that's not that's not me i, I even sounds like if you ever ask me to come back i'll tell you what none of it right like i don't want nothing to do with it 
But the day <laughs> after... None of it in none of it. Exactly. None of it, yeah. So it was... But you know what? I met the coolest people there. Like, that little girl in the patch, she, like, she, she had me, like, right wrapped around her finger the moment mm. I met her. Yeah, she, and she was brave, and she was courageous. She was everything I wasn't at her age. You know, we're yeah. flying on this boat, and she's on the edge of the boat like this, this, like, hair okay, in the wind. So. And I'm, like, gripping this boat. I'm seeing <laughs> icebergs, like, you know, I'm, the, like, 25-year-old man. At the, a tank. Yeah, and, you know... It, yeah. None of it. I don't know if none of it was supposed to be the most um, memorable uh, part of our adventure, mm -hmm. but for me it was. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I never seen like I said, like in in the in the trailer, I said I never felt so foreign in my own country. Yeah. It's because it didn't feel like I was in my own country. Would you go back? I would go back. I would go back, but I could not live there. I will <laughs> say that. I'm, I'm not gonna <laughs> pretend. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Those people are tough people. Yeah. Flights you know? also need to be cheaper up there. Yeah, like, that's right. Them to to leave Kimarut. It's like a half an hour flight over to Callowit, even to get medical help. Mm -hmm. yeah. Their flight return is astronomical. And I'm like, something needs to be done for that because in the summertime, yeah. there's no frozen water for them to take over to Callowit. It's all water. Yeah. It's so a lot of times existence. people can't leave. And so that was a different side. There's a lot of different sides that we saw that, unfortunately, because there's so much footage yeah. that was there that I'm like, that's a pretty big problem. I want to go to another clip here while we still have time. Now, this one has you guys heading to Muscochis. For three days, they will sing, dance, drum, and honor their culture. Wow, this is a big powder, a big thing. It's going to be interesting to see if we're, like, well, welcomed or not. But for Dallas, Ashley, and Don, the idea of attending this gathering as outsiders makes them nervous. We don't belong here. No. Nope. The two girls in that hut did not want us here. No? No. Check this guy's hair. Check this guy's hair. Holy Take note of the number of police vehicles ahead of us. We're stick out like orange jumpsuits, man. Like, I'm definitely a little uneased about what I'm saying here. I've been to a lot of powwows. What the hell did you think was going to happen? That there? was my first one. I had That's never seen wrong. a powwow in my life. But at the same time, again, there's a lot of stuff that, unfortunately, just wasn't shown. So the comment were about the girls didn't want us here. When we were going through, there was a hut, and she was flipping us off and just saying things that weren't the nicest okay. towards us in the van. And then when we got out of the van, the, I'm assuming I could be wrong, the chief at the powwow was saying horrible things over the microphone and I'm like he's supposed to be a leader yeah it was like things yeah. like the white man has taken this from us and like for a white man to come into a, a situation where he's uncomfortable with I feel like you should just lock that door so maybe and just because call they saw that it's like some white people roll into their powwow I, 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 they 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 I, I don't think they did we were rolling in and it just so happened that we all got out of the van and mm. then we That's hear this I'm like did you just I'm like, this is not okay. Like, we're here to experience mm. the powwow and experience this culture. And then we're hearing over the microphone pretty much just bashing white people. And I'm like, yeah. okay. Yeah. It's a double-edged yeah. sword. I mean, of course, you can understand. Yeah, you can yeah. understand why they're so angry. But we also, you know, to reconcile, it has to come from both sides. It can't just be... Meet in the middle. Yeah, I want to. Exactly. I want to know what each of you learned from all of this. Jamie Sue, we're going to start with you. What did you? How has this changed you? And what did you learn? Uh, this experience completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, once I got done the show, uh, the community in Muskrat Dam invited me back up. So I moved there for a month and worked at Reverend Tom Beardy's um, rehabilitation center, where I got to you know immerse myself and you know my roommates and hear stories. And, and so for me. After all of that, I think part of the healing process, mm -hmm. we really need consistent mental health support mm -hmm. and we need stronger rehab and rehabilitation for addictions mm -hmm. because it is so hard and scary to reach out and ask for help and yeah. people are dying waiting mm -hmm. and they're not getting that consistent. Who else? Sorry. No. Who, okay. who else learned something or that you want to share with us? Well, I started off from knowing nothing, so everything I learned was you know, substantial, you know, everything from people, people compare um, indigenous people inside of Canada the exact same as African people inside of America when it comes to jail. They're overpopulated. Um, 
you know, we were talking to one guy, and he basically said, like, look, if a white guy does this crime and an indigenous guy does the same crime, there's a good chance that this indigenous person is going to go to jail for a lot longer than this guy. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's unfair. They're being overpopulated. You know, we learned that, you know, not all our tax dollars are going right to, uh, you know, the reserves and to the Indian people. Your perspective changed. I, what I learned the most and what's the most valuable thing I can say now is that it's about relationships with people. Mm -hmm. That is what means the most. When I talk to Rick Lightning, Sydney, Sydney Gill, all these people, they emphasize on relationships. And, um, you know, there's a good saying that a U-Haul is never going to be able to follow your hearse. So that means, like, you can have all these things in this world, you know, a nice car, these toys, yeah, all these things. Good. But at the end of the day, that won't matter. It's the relationships and the people that you have these connections with throughout life. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is what matters. And it opened my eyes when I came back home from New Brunswick. When I came back home from this experience to New Brunswick, my mom was like, I feel like you're a new person. And it's just because, like, my oh, perspective. Yeah, my mom, like, she noticed it right at me right away. Like, it's how I talked and, like, you know, how I was talking to my friends. And it's just, like. I learned so much in this 28 days that it was just like my perspective has changed through and through. I like to hear that. That's very interesting. Yeah. I think help needs to be done on, on both sides. And Avalee touched on that just mm -hmm. a little bit ago that as much as I am helping, like I want to continue to help and educate. Like mm -hmm. this has opened my eyes up to like I want to be an advocate to help. At the same time, it needs to be both sides looking together to shake hands to help one another. Like in the like we did for the treaties. Exactly. That were then so we promptly. Should, yeah. But and as so. people, we need to work together and stop looking back and start mm -hmm. looking ahead. And I think we need to really start working hard with that because it's I a agree, more concerted it, effort. Yes. To, to kind of, let's get moving forward here it's together. It's hard for us to <clears throat> go forward when you don't know where you're coming from. And I think that's the majority of Canada, and mm -hmm. you can see it here in us when we started this journey. Uh, we we started out not knowing any of these things. So how can we? We don't know. You we don't need know to move forward because yeah. we didn't know right. there was anything wrong. Now we do, and now we want to move forward. Mm -hmm. But the rest of Canada has to catch up. Don, did you learn anything? I learned a few things, and I still have to go back to the statement that this was not my first experience with Indigenous people. Right. My first experience with Indigenous people, I was two years old. I don't need to know about what happened when you were two. From no, it's all good stuff. Trip, it's all good stuff. That's my fine, point. But what, I have from the 28 day trip, what did you trip, learn from that? Like that from I, this experience on this show specifically, the, what the, did you learn? Well, actually, I learned it just before the show. I found out about what the treaty money was all about, and I did not know that until just before this trip. But what do you take away from the show? Like the 28 days of us gone, like, what, did you, what were you able to take away from that? I, I'm not even sure what I wanted to take away from it. I was looking, because we didn't know before the show there exactly where we were going or, or what it was related to or anything else. Not what so. you wanted to take away, but at, on day 28, how did you feel? Like, was there anything that you, you learned that could maybe shifted your views a little bit? Not really, no. And did you take anything in your heart with you when you left? Was there, did you feel something in your heart? Your soul, your brain. No. Nothing in your brain. Nothing changed. Nothing in your heart. Nothing, Nothing. changed. Okay. Okay. Because mm, it's it's Ross. Mm. I was just thinking. I I thought about the people that I and I like in when I was in Edmonton. I went and visited a couple guys that I went and seen at the jail. Oh yeah. Yeah. At Christmas I went and brought them something. Nice. Kind of just pop by and you know because I mean, it wasn't that they were Indians or natives or bad guys. Mm. They were people. So, you know what I mean? I just, normal people met, you know, was, ha was had good conversation, spent a couple of days with, you know, they're in a, you know, they're trying to improve their life. So, hey, I wanted to pop in, see how they were doing. And, and that's how what are I, they doing? Well, one, yeah, both of them are doing great. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the one guy, they did a lot of on the show, and then another guy they, they never did. But, right. uh, you know, and I ran, I ran into them on, on my lunch break one day. I ran into one of the guys. You know, they're, you know, like I said, it's nothing but positive, right? I like to hear that. So, yeah. you know what I mean? And, you know, everybody, like everyone in this room or everyone in uh, in life has a little bit of down and out. And guess the only way you can get down and out is if you look after yourself and, you know, I like go it. from there. There's one last thing I'd like to say before. We don't have time. We're out of time. Too bad. So I have to say thanks to each and every one of you for coming on. And I'm sure the people who have watched this show are happy to have this, the, the debrief with you after. 
Uh, I'm Melissa Ridge, and thank you all for joining me on this APTN special. We took first contact and put it in focus. Have a great night. It's day two in Kimmerud. Dallas, Ross, and Jamie Sue are about to have the adventure of a lifetime. Hello. Anya. Anya, a local hunter, his daughter, and the Padlock family are taking them out on the frigid Arctic waters for a seal hunt. It's an experience few Canadians will ever have. Oh my God, there's an iceberg over here. That's insane. That's my first iceberg. 